Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church. And this is the first Wednesday in the season of Advent. Um, uh, we'd like to welcome those that are joining us via our YouTube channel, whether that's uh, right now or later on in the day, uh, as you're able to watch our worship service for this day. Um, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Reverend Lewis Bolt. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Hammond, Louisiana, and we're, we're glad you found our channel and that you're able to join us and participate with our worship service. If you haven't already done so, please click the link in the description of the video. It will take you to a PDF of the service so that you can follow along and participate wherever you happen to be. There will be times when I invite the congregation to stand as you are able. If I forget that last part, please forgive me. But if you're not able to stand, you may remain seated during those parts of the service. Uh, we will have organ accompaniments via technology, uh, assuming I press the right buttons at the right times. Um, but I think we'll be okay if there's only three hymns that we'll be singing. There'll be a short introduction, a brief introduction on each of the hymns, and then we'll begin singing. So if you would, those of you uh, worshiping in person, prepare your hymnals to find those hymns already. That would be good before the service starts. And then today, and throughout the season of ad, our midweek services, I should say, uh, for our midweek Advent services, we'll be us using the service of prayer and preaching, uh, which is found uh, in your hymnal on page 260, uh, so you can mark that as well. Uh, there's one uh, um, uh, correction on the tab of the bulletin. The hymn of the day will come after the sermon, as is our practice. I just I forgot to move that uh, today uh, when I printed these, uh, so please forgive me. But the, the hymn of the day will occur after the sermon um, as following our customary practice. I don't think there are any other surprises in, for, in store for us. Uh, this morning for our worship service, we will, we will be using Luther's morning prayer and this evening we'll use Luther's evening prayer. They're both listed there uh, because of the, the dual services. All right. Um, let, well, let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling us into your house where your glory dwells as your light shines forth into this world of darkness through your word that is read and proclaimed in this place. You have brought us here so that we would hear that word, that it would convict us of our sins, and that we would be led to repentance, and that you would turn us around and bring us back to you to receive that forgiveness that Christ has won for us and freely pours out upon us. Bless this time that we have together as we give you thanks and praise for everything that you continue to do for us through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so our opening hymn is hymn 352, which is uh, Let the Earth Now Praise the Lord with a Brief Introduction.
invite you to stand as you are able for the opening verses found on page 260 uh, printed in your hymnal. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the, the name, name of the Lord, Lord is to be praised. praised. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our, Our God, God shall come. He does not keep silence. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation may sprout forth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we can, our service continues as we speak the words of the Old Testament canticle, beginning on page 261 in your hymnal. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Our service will continue with the readings. The first reading for the first Wednesday in Advent is from Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses says... The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Isaiah writes, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garments of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our third reading comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Luke writes these words. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, 
and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our service will continue with the responsory uh, found on page 263 for the season of Advent. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Our service will continue as we review three of the six chief parts of the faith, beginning with the Ten Commandments that we will recite together. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I invite you to stand as you are able as we confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As our service will continue, as uh, during this season of Advent, we'll be reviewing uh, the Ten Commandments and their explanations as Luther wrote them uh, in the small catechism. They're printed for you in your bulletin. Uh, Congregational responses are indicated by a C and an O. The first commandment, you You shall have have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The second commandment, you shall have no Shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic hearts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. The third commandment remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Our service will continue momentarily with the sermon, but we will begin by calling upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of him who came and will come again, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came for the forgiveness of our sins and for eternal life and salvation. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. During this season of Advent, on our midweek services, we will be meditating on the offices of Christ Jesus. Jesus has three offices, three positions that he not only fills, but fulfills, as we will see as we go through uh, our midweek services. Jesus is the, the final fulfillment of those types that we will encounter in the Old Testament. And today, we begin with this office of prophets. Now, prophets 
were people that God selected, the one true God, Yahweh, selected to be his mouthpiece. Now, a mouthpiece, not the instrument's mouthpiece, but the mouthpiece of a prophet is the one who speaks on behalf of the one who sent him. And so God raises up prophets. We heard about the prophet Moses in our first reading, that God raised up Moses to go speak to Pharaoh, to speak the words that God gave him to speak to Pharaoh, to let his people go. And, and the reading we heard today is, is in that last month of Moses' life, before the Lord calls him to rest with his fathers, to die, uh, Moses promises the people that God, the one true God, Yahweh, will raise up another prophet like him, but who's actually better than him, as we'll hear momentarily from Deuteronomy chapter 34. But the mouthpiece of the Lord, the prophet of Yahweh, was designed to do one thing and one thing only. That office was to proclaim the word that God gave to his prophet to speak to his people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also to anyone whom the Lord God sends the prophet to, such as the nations around the Israelites. You can think of the prophet Jonah was sent to Nineveh to proclaim the word of the Lord, right? These prophets were supposed to speak the word that God gave them to speak. And as you look through the Old Testament, one thing that you will quickly realize, if you don't know this already, is that the prophet was sent to the people, it doesn't matter if they're God's people or the nations around them, to proclaim one message. And the message was this, repent, change your ways. Now that message of repentance sometimes involved forth telling, telling of the truth, but also foretelling, telling of things to come in the future. Every prophet whom the Lord God called to be his mouthpiece, that was at the heart of every message that God sent the prophet to speak. Why? Well, you good Lutherans know the answer to that, right? It's because man is conceived and born with sin. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, our original, apparent, our original parents, ancestors, uh, who disobeyed God's command to not eat of the, tree of the, uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they became, when they did, they corrupted themselves, and then every one of their offspring born after them, born in the image of man, no longer the image of God. So God calls his prophets to speak the word of repentance so that his people and the nations would do one thing and one thing only. The goal was to be turned around. Instead of walking away from God, living a life of sin, God wants them to turn around and come back to him so that they can be restored into a right relationship with him. That was the purpose of every prophet whom God called to speak his word. Sometimes it involved foretell, foretelling, telling of the truth, sometimes foretelling, but at the heart of it, the message is repent because God's judgment is at hand. When you think about Moses, that first prophet we encountered in our first reading, Moses was sent to Pharaoh to speak the word of God, to let the people go. If you don't let the people go, these are the things that are going to happen. Now, for those of you participating in our People of the Word reading program, you know that we're in that part of the book of Exodus with the plagues. And the plagues were God's judgment on the people, on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, but also upon their gods to show that he was the one true God and that their gods were nothing. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, we hear these words. Uh, Moses, well, not Moses, because Moses is now dead. Whoever's finishing the book uh, of the book of Deuteronomy writes these words in chapter 34, beginning in verse uh, nine. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then he writes these words. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, 
None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. No prophet, no prophet was like Moses in how he knew God, Yahweh, and how Yahweh equipped him and enabled him to do the mighty signs and wonders. No prophet throughout the Old Testament was as good or great as Moses. Moses becomes the archetype, the example of all prophets. They're to emulate him. They'll never achieve the standard but they're to emulate him and to speak the word that God gives them to speak as Moses spoke the word to God's people and to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. No prophet in the Old Testament ever measured up to Moses. But Moses is not the great prophet. You see, Moses is a type an example of a greater one to come. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear these words from the Gospel of St. John in the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Moses was selected to speak God's word to the people, and God used him to speak the word to them in the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, the law. But the word that was with God in the beginning, the pre-incarnate Christ, he takes on human flesh, The word becomes flesh itself and dwells amongst his people. And he speaks words of grace and words of truth. Not that the words of Moses were false, but Jesus speaks a different word to God's people and to all people. You see, the word becomes flesh so that he can speak the word that God the Father has given him to speak to all people. It's a word that is designed to convict. But it's also a word that is designed to make new. You see, Jesus came into this world not to condemn the world, my dear friends. The world was already in a state of condemnation. The world has been in a state of condemnation from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned in that Garden of Eden. It's been in a state of condemnation, but Jesus comes. The word becomes flesh so that he can save the world. You see, this prophet is different from other prophets of old. This prophet is the word made flesh who speaks God's grace and truth into a world of darkness so that that world and those people can be saved. Uh, Jesus says this. In in John chapter 14, uh, verse 10. Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the the works themselves. You see... Jesus reveals that the words that he speaks are the words that his heavenly Father has given him to speak. And the Father dwells where? In him. And he is in the Father. And so everything the Father gives to him, he speaks into the world so that that word can go forth and accomplish the purposes for which God sends it. Other prophets heard the word of the Lord, or they saw a vision of the word of the Lord, and they went and spoke. But now, God has sent his son into the world, born of the virgin, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. And he comes to speak the word of truth. You see, Jesus 
doesn't need to speak words of condemnation. He comes to speak a word, much like the prophets of old, but a, a better word. He comes to speak the word of repentance. In, in Matthew's gospel account, uh, Matthew writes that uh, when Jesus starts his public ministry, uh, Matthew says uh, that Jesus went out proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand. The kingdom of heaven is present in me. Now, now you remember those words of the prophet Isaiah, right? Uh, when, when, when Isaiah spoke about this one to come who, who would preach the good news, who would heal the sick and bind up the wounds, give sight to the blind, make the mute, uh, sing for joy in the lame walk. And, and then we heard in our third reading for today from the gospel according to St. Luke, when Jesus visited his hometown in Nazareth, he went into the synagogue, opened up the scroll to that exact same spot, and he wrote, read rather, those very words that Isaiah spoke, and then Jesus sat down. And, and you, you remember what Jesus said. These words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Isaiah prophesied of one to come who would do all those things, and then Jesus says, they are fulfilled in your hearing. Meaning, I am the one. I am the fulfiller of the promise of old. I have come to do that which God sent me to do. And Jesus does it perfectly. Jesus is the perfect prophet. Where, where all the prophets of old had shortcomings, Jesus is the perfect prophet because he is the very Son of God in the flesh. And Jesus reveals to you and to me and to the hearers that he speaks to in John chapter 8 why he has come. In John chapter 8, beginning at verse 21, uh, Jesus says these words to them again, uh, to his disciples. I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. And the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, but I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus reveals in, the, in his testimony in his hometown in the city of Nazareth, and then also in John chapter 8 with those words that we just heard, that it's only through belief in him that people will be saved from their sins. And, and you remember what Jesus' name means, right? He saves his people from their sins. God sends his son into the world to proclaim a word of truth, a word of grace. You see, at the time of Christ, God's people, the, the religious leaders of God's people, they had developed 603 additional commandments to the 10 that God gave them. 613 commandments that the people of God were supposed to follow in order to be righteous. But Jesus comes to fulfill the law for those who can't fulfill the law. For, for those people and for people like you and me who are conceived and born with sin, Jesus comes to save us from our sins by becoming sin itself on the cross. Jesus, in a little later in chapter 8 of uh, Gospels according to St. John, he says this in verse 28, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father has taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus is the perfect, obedient Son of God who comes to do that which the Father sends him to do. And it's manifested. It's manifested on the cross, my brothers and sisters. That is where we see Jesus accomplish everything that his heavenly father has sent him to do. In, in John chapter 3, we, we hear these words that most of us are very familiar with, especially one of the verses that you're about to hear. But starting at verse 14, Jesus says these words. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, God sends his son into the world to redeem the world, to buy it back from its state of sin, to buy you and me back from our, the state of sin that we were born with and all the sins that we have committed. And it happens as the son of God, the son of man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is lifted high upon the cross because it's at the cross where Jesus, who knew no sin, becomes sin itself. And he sheds his perfect holy blood. He, he suffers and dies. The innocent one suffers and dies for things that he never committed so that you and I and all people could be saved. And, and we are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. You see, it's in the words of Christ that you and I were saved. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. It's through the prophecy and the, the words that Jesus speaks that he saves people because the Holy Spirit creates the faith in our hearts that trust in his work for our salvation. Hear these words from Jesus' lips recorded in John chapter 12, starting at verse 47. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken of my own authority. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I, what I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus comes to speak the word. A word that convicts, but a word that makes alive as well. Jesus doesn't need to judge the world. Jesus doesn't need to judge those who don't believe in him. Jesus comes to seek the lost. Those who are outside the kingdom of God, both of the Israelites and the Greeks, he says, there, there will be one, I have a sheep of another fold, another flock, but I must gather them together so that there will be one flock and, and one shepherd. Jesus comes to speak, and he continues to come and speak his word into this world of darkness that we live in. It's a word that goes forth. It's the very words that God has given him to do that which we can't do for ourselves. To convict and to make alive. Because we all believe that we're good enough, or at least we try hard, but... But Jesus' word convicts us of that worldview. It says, you will never be good enough, but I am. Yeah, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And I ask you, how are you doing with that commandment? And, and if you're like me, I have to confess that I haven't. I haven't loved the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might. But there is one who has, and his name is Jesus. And he did that for me and for you and for all people. So that that word that creates faith has an object to cling to. Our object that we cling to is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's greatest prophet. God's true prophet. 
who speaks words that give new life. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That is Jesus' promise to you who trust in him for your salvation. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please join me in singing our hymn of the day, uh, hymn uh, 545, Word of God Come Down on Earth, uh, with a brief introduction and uh, hope I'm on the right track. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our hearts and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the holy Christian church here in scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For Pearl Genevieve Heck, uh, for the safe birth and the safety of mother and child, we give you thanks, O Lord, and we pray that you watch over Pearl until she's brought into your kingdom through the waters of holy baptism. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Finally, for these and for all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We pray the collect of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the incarnate word of God who comes to speak the final word against sin, death, and the devil, and the ultimate word on eternal life and salvation. May your word continually lead us to turn back to you in repentant faith to receive your word of promise, the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray the collect for the word. <laughs> Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue as we pray Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you in his mighty right hand uh, from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 523 which is a word of God incarnate with a brief introduction.
with us and hope you can join us next Wednesday, on the second Wednesday of the season of Advent, as we will be meditating on uh, the office of Christ Jesus' priest, his priestly office. So hopefully you can join us for that um, uh, worship service, and we'd like to hope, hopefully you, those that are joining us via our YouTube channel will also be able to join us uh, for that service as well. Um, there is no departure music today, and I don't think there are any announcements other than I hope to see you on Sunday for our second Sunday in Advent uh, service. And don't forget uh, that uh, coming up soon is our congregational Christmas dinner. If you would like to sign up to help people plan, there's a sign-up sheet in the cross hallway. And we, we are having a soup supper at, at 6 o'clock this evening if you'd like to come back and participate with that uh, before the evening worship service. Um, that's it as far as I know. So I will greet you in the back, and we, we pray that God will keep us all safe and secure in his mighty right hand until we see one another again. <laughs>